One of Dartmouth's best-known landmarks is the Aponagansett Meeting House, built in 1790. Who put it there? Where did the idea for it come from? The wanderers found the answer recently in Newport on neighboring Aquidneck Island. I'm talking with Rebecca Luchak, who is a professor of art history at Roger Williams College. Mm -hmm. And we're here in Newport at the um, History Project of the New England Yearly Meeting. And I understand you had a lot to do with that. Could you tell us about it? I did. Um, there's a group of historians who got together and talked uh, about an exhibit for this very important anniversary of the Quakers of New England. This is our 350th year as New England Yearly Meeting, and we wanted to celebrate that event, uh, first of all, by coming back to the great meeting house in Newport, which had always been the meeting place for the annual gathering of Quakers, friends, uh, in New England uh, up until the 1960s, and then um, the meeting house was turned to the Historical Society of Newport. Uh, since that time, though, um, many people have known it as this huge clabbered building that sits on a big open lot uh, on the way out of Newport, but very few people have had an opportunity to really come in and see the building itself. And what's really striking about it is, first of all, it, it was built in 1699. It was the biggest building in Rhode Island at the time it was built. And it was built to house a thriving community of Quakers here. Quakers who really were the um, leaders of their community. They were the leading businessmen, the leading legislators. We have a number of governors who were Quakers, and of course, uh, one of the brothers of the Brown family, Moses Brown, is a renowned Quaker. So for this celebration, uh, we uh, decided we would do a kind of sweeping history of Quakers in New England for 350 years. Well, where did you get the text for this? The story, which starts in the 1600s and goes all the way up till today, is really excerpted from the book that is the guidance of uh, friends throughout the world. It is called Faith and Practice, and that book is not a, a creed, it is not a religious um, dictate, it is rather a set of guidances and includes a very comprehensive history of the Society of Friends. And we excerpted from that history from uh, the New England Faith and Practice and uh, adapted it for an exhibition. And I think as you look around these panels, you'll see that certain people are highlighted. Well, over here. Over here we have Paul Cuffey, who is from Westport. And mm -hmm. so this is something people of Dartmouth would be interested in. Mm -hmm. Can you tell how you chose those pictures? Sure, Paul Cuffey is an extremely important figure in, the his, in our history, our history of uh, the American uh, community in general, in, in broad strokes. And he's uh, someone that um, was very much involved with the uh, anti-slavery movement. As you know, he was uh, the organizer of a movement to repatriate um, former slaves to Sierra Leone. He was very, a very uh, successful businessman here in, in New England and was involved in the whaling trade, which a lot of Quakers were involved in. If you ever read Moby Dick, you know that um, you know, that's all about the Quaker community in Nantucket and um, New Bedford certainly was part of that. So Paul Cuffey, working out of New Bedford, uh, was an extre self-taught, extremely intelligent man, uh, really worked hard um, for the abolition of, of, of the slaves, and um, 
we have some just some really beautiful images of him here. The most recent story of Paul Cuffey is the school that was created in Providence that's dedicated to him. So I think his, and it's a very successful school, uh, it was started by a Quaker um, who had formerly been head of a Quaker school down in the Philadelphia area. And that school is really thriving, and I think it's a real tribute to Paul Cuffey and his vision uh, and his incredible determination to both better himself and to better the future of African Americans in this country. Well, that's the Paul Cuffey Charter School, right? That's right. The um, school children from there came when they had his birthday celebration at the Westport Friends oh, meeting lovely. and participated in the commemoration. Lovely. The other thing I want to point out is it's not just here a history of kind of the great um, figures of the past in, in Quaker community, but also the people of every day. And we've included in the exhibit stories of everyday life. And I want to point out here a young woman. This is an incredibly poignant portrait of a young Quaker woman who's coming out of the Apanagansett uh, meeting house. And it's actually a postcard uh, that was produced, published in New Bedford. Uh, and you can see that, you know, she ascribes to the plain dress of Quakers of the time. Um, there, were, there was a real emphasis on simplicity as one of the testimonies of the Quakers. Other testimonies are pac pacifism, peace, um, stewardship, um, uh, um, I'm going to forget them, but <laughs> equality, thank you. Um, and so that's just a really lovely kind of view into um, a very average, everyday moment in Quaker life in New England. Well, the, the people from Aponagansett from the Dartmouth Monthly Meeting were coming here as early as 1656. Mm -hmm. And uh, when this um, building was m built in 1699, mm -hmm. at the same time the, this Newport meeting set off, it's called, the Dartmouth Monthly Meeting, mm -hmm. and the people um, worshipped on the same property mm -hmm. in Dartmouth. But a hundred years later, 1790, is when mm -hmm. they built the meeting house that you can see with yeah. this uh, granite step that everyone steps on going in and out of the meeting, including, I wish sure, Paul Cuffey. <laughs> That's great, yeah. The story goes on up to the present day, and um, the story includes, again, common everyday folks, Quakers who are contributing around the world. We have active um, uh, communities in Kenya. Actually, Kenya is the, the largest um, number of Quakers, as, as you know, well know. Uh, and we also are involved with uh, friend schools in other uh, countries. We have a real strong interest in the Ramallah Friend School in, um, in uh, Palestine. And um, people are really, the American Friends Service Committee, of course, has had a very active role in international uh, humanitarian aid. So the story begins um, with the 1600s. It sweeps through time and ends with the 21st century and it's on exhibit at the Great Meeting House in Newport and I hope that people will come and see just how important Quakers are to the early history of our country but how important Quakers are still today uh, as activists, as uh, people working to create a better world, a more peaceful world, uh, and we're celebrating that, our 350th birthday, here at the Great Meeting House today. Well, I'd like to add a note about, about the Ramallah School, because Eli and Sybil Jones traveled from uh, China Lake, which is north of Augusta, by buggy, to the Meeting House on Spring Street in New Bedford. So this is something Dartmouth people would also be interested in, to ask if the people who ha had a great deal of money from the whaling industry and the shipping industry, if they would contribute to their work so that they could go to Palestine to start a school for girls. And so there are letters hanging on the Meeting House in New Bedford still that uh, document this work from, yes, from Ramallah School. So that's yet another um, mention here in this context. I just, I think I'd like to um, close by saying that this is a project that has a long way to go with much to add and what you're just saying now is something that we really need to put into that chapter, if you will, that section of the story. So I hope we can talk more and add to this great history that we have here. I'm talking with Betsy Kasdan 
a historian in the Society of Friends. But what's interesting about her is that her family was here when they built this meeting. That's right. Um, my, my mother was a Borden, and the Bordens were one of the early families in Portsmouth. And Portsmouth and Newport were part of the same monthly meeting. So, you know, they were very involved in that really from the beginning until the early 19th century. And I think it was my great, great, I don't know, umpteenth great grandfather was on the building committee in 1698 for this building. So I feel very connected. I, being in the building and looking up at those beams, um, I feel very, very connected with it. Well, now, all of these years, all of your ancestors have been Quakers and remained to serve? They were sort of on and off. Um, individual members would get disowned. Um, one of them for having a drinking problem, which was interesting because more recent generations of my family, there's been some of that. What, what does disowned mean? A disowned means that you're no longer considered in membership because of something you've done. Um, in researching this meeting, one of the most common reasons people got brought in for discipline was the baby was born too soon after the wedding. So a lot of things haven't changed that much. Um, but if you said you were sorry and you really wanted to stay a Quaker, they would let you stay. So my people were Quakers um, really into the beginning of the 19th century, and then they moved out to Indiana, and I think from then on were not. And then, and then how did it come back down to you? I came at it independently and as a teenager, and after I joined, my great aunt said, well, you know, the family used to be Quakers, and I had no idea. And she gave me the genealogy book, and there they all were, and I've now read them in the Quaker records, and there they all are, and I didn't know that. And then I moved, five years ago, I moved to Rhode Island, and suddenly I'm, like, in my place. Well, so you were, this is sort of a second career for you to, to right. give yourself to researching these wonderful right. people of Rhode Island. Yeah, I was a lawyer for 25 years, but I always wanted to do history, so. Well, I know that we've heard you speak when you came to speak at the Westport Historical Society over at the right. Westport meeting, yeah. and that's why I want to talk to you now. You're, you're part of the display. You helped to make the display that we saw, right? That's With right. With Rebecca. That's right. We, um, we redid the our faith and practice, the book of discipline that we use, is in the process of revision. And maybe five or six years ago, we revised the history chapter. And so the text of the display here is based on the text that, that the yearly meeting approved for the new history chapter. But we had to, you know, we had to condense it and abridge it and so on. So I was involved with that. Well, where did you get the beautiful picture of the tapestry, the uh, Mary Fisher? Who was Mary Fisher? Wasn't, isn't her? Yeah, it's Mary Fisher. Mary Fisher was one of a pair of women who came to New England as Quaker evangelists in 1656. She was a servant in a wealthy household, but Quakers believed that God could speak through anybody. And so she and Anne Austin, who was older, um, you know, was more like a matron, came here to try and convince the good people of Boston and New England. And they were treated very, very badly and eventually were shipped, involuntarily shipped back to Barbados. The Quaker Tapestry Project is actually a project that some women in Britain yearly meetings started. Um, and there are tapestry panels from all different parts of Quaker history mostly in Britain and in Europe and a little bit in the United States, not so much the rest of the world, but we happened to pick that panel. Well, Dina Chase from Westport said that she was, that her meeting worked on one of the panels and sent it to England. So I'm hoping we'll be yeah. able to get some of the, more, more information about it and show it on Dartmouth Cable TV because it's so yeah. beautiful, yeah. so colorful. They, they have, if you, um, they have a website, if you, typed in Quaker Tapestry, Kendall, K-E-N-D-A-L. That's the town in England where the tapestry exhibit is located. And you can go on their website and you can look at the different panels. And um, it, it's really very interesting the way they've made, you know, Quakers early on were, were sort of 
ultra Puritan and they didn't have any use for art. And so it's been very interesting to watch art being used to express Quaker identity. And tomorrow we'll start the formal celebration at um, the 350th yearly meeting at Bryant College where, they, where friends take the whole campus and have the junior high and in the townhouses and the high school and the dorms and families can go and camp and yep. yeah. but this is where yearly meeting was held this building is where yearly meeting was held from 1699 to 1905 except during the American Revolution when Newport was occupied by the British military and so and there was no you couldn't get transport on or off the island and so yearly meeting was held in Smithfield for two or three years, but other than that, it was here. Well, thank building. you. Th thank you very much. This building was where we met up until 1905, as I'm sure some of you have said. Um, I work for the yearly meeting that's uh, representing 68 local groups and we all come together, there are about 4,000 Quakers in New England, we come together tomorrow, a uh, little over 650, 700 people will gather for the week to hear where God wants us to be, where God wants us to be moving uh, in our in our religious society and as individuals and as groups and meetings and honoring this building it's there's some kind of a bit of idolatry of looking at a building this old 1699 and we used to meet here now owned by historical society and in some ways Quakers have become more of an historical footnote in some of our places and I think that that is something I would like to change in the sense that we want to look beyond just our history to uh, in front and forward and moving into this next century in a way that will have uh, the healing power of the Holy Spirit that can change lives, change the way we're living, in, uh, environmental degradation, wars, and that there be a springtime for the Holy Spirit to take um, over our lives. And that I think friends have an incredible message where we sit in what we call silent waiting worship, listening for the prompting of the divine to lead us to acts that will change the world. And that that sense of listening spirituality is at the heart of the Quaker message listening and walking with Christ. That's where we come from. And so here in this gathering today, there are about 200 of us who will hear some of our history, but we'll also be hearing where we need to go in the next few years. So that's, that's where I'm sensing things are. Well, it's very interesting to me when I come to yearly meeting to see that there are people there, some uh, have been there 50 years, that they give their vacations, they take their vacations from work so that mm. they can spend a week together. And I think that's where some of the uh, creative energy comes from. These large groups that get together and then they sit and wait to see if God speaks and to see if God speaks to the person next to them. You know, it's very, very interesting. And also what's interesting is how many young people yeah. are, are really touched by this. And um, you probably will have um, nearly 100 young people. Well, a that will, hundred, yeah, a yeah, couple hundred young people. Roughly, that another 700, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and there'll be young people from Dartmouth there too. Yeah, good. Yeah. That's great. So thank you very much, right. Jonathan. Well, I would say God's always speaking. It's us that need to listen. So that's that's yes. the point uh, of what Friends are about. And so I, I thank you, Pam, for this time. And thank you, folks, there. Mm -hmm.